our goal is to help us be able to interpret our culture and say, hey, how does this reflect with what the Bible has to say? And so we take a look at movies and we look at one of the themes of the movies and we say, hey, what does the Bible have to say about that? And so tonight we're doing that with the movie Lion. Now, usually I get up here and say, hey, we're not endorsing these movies. You don't have to have seen these movies. But I'm going to tell you, go see that movie. Yeah. All right. That was a good movie. How many people saw the movie Lion here? There you go. See? Uh, now, if you didn't see it, that's all right. You can still do that later. Uh, you know, not tonight. Uh, don't do it right now on your phone while I'm preaching. Don't do that. The movie Lion, as you saw in that trailer, is actually about this guy named Saru. And what happened was he grew up in India in a family that was very loving. He had a mother and a brother. He just adored his older brother. But they were a very poor family. And his brother, who at the start of the movie is probably, you know, nine or ten, he, Saru, is probably about five years old at the start of the movie, his brother actually goes and works at night. He goes and just finds whatever kind of odd jobs he can to make some money to help his family eat. And one day, Saru tries to convince his brother to let him go to work overnight with him. And so Saru says, tries to convince his brother, and finally his brother says, okay, you can come with me. So he takes Saru with him to go work overnight, gets on the train, gets to their train station, and Saru, he's a five-year-old kid. So even though he wanted to go, he fell asleep, right? He fell asleep, and so the brother puts Saru down on this bench in the, uh, in the train station there, and he tells him, don't, don't, don't move till I get back. Well, Saru wakes up in the middle of the night, doesn't really understand what has gone on. He's, he was tired of this whole thing. And so he goes and tries to look for his brother. And he walks around the train station yelling for his brother. And he happens to see this one train that has the doors open on it. And so he walks into this train that the doors are open and yells for his brother, doesn't see him, lays down on the bench, falls asleep. He wakes up when that train starts moving. And for whatever reason, that train didn't stop for a few days, and he ends up a thousand miles away from home in Calcutta, in this just crazy, busy city as a five-year-old kid, completely separated from, from his family. And he, at some point, meets with the authorities and tries to explain to them who he is, tries to tell, tell where his hometown is, but he's mispronouncing it because he's five years old. So at five years old, he gets separated from his family. And, and I have to jump past some of the kind of crazier things that happen in that phase where he uh, saves himself from being kind of abducted into slavery. And he gets into this orphanage that's really like a prison, just an absolutely horrible orphanage. But ultimately, he gets adopted. He gets adopted by a relatively wealthy family that lives in Australia. And so he gets to go and he lives in Australia and he gets adopted into his family. They are a loving, kind family. He grows up with them. He goes to college. He gets a job. He has a girlfriend. And then he has a major crisis. He has a major crisis because he can't stop thinking about his family, his mom and his brother that he got separated from. And in fact, it goes to the point where he obsesses over this. He breaks up with his girlfriend. He sets up his bedroom like a war room where he's trying to understand. He scours Google Earth, and he scours the memories that he has of five years old. In fact, we're going to watch a clip that starts with him talking to his girlfriend, basically breaking up with his girlfriend and trying to figure out how he can find his family. Check this out. So this, that clip shows... Actually, that's near the beginning. He actually spends four years after he quit his job and leaves his girlfriend obsessing because he's just so obsessed with finding his family. He cannot move forward in his life until he understands a little bit more about where he came from. And there's a lot of great things we could talk about from this movie. Hopefully, if you watch this movie, it makes you excited about helping kids that need it, maybe adopting my wife's uh, best friend from uh, high school actually started working at an adoption agency. She now runs an adoption agency. She's single. She never got married. She adopted six kids on her own, and she tended to adopt the kids that had some special health needs because she knew those ones were harder to adopt. And to be honest, the church should be doing more to help kids who need it the most. And if you watch this movie, hopefully you're inspired to help kids that need it. We could be talking about that, but there was... Something that I kind of saw as I watched this movie, and I finished watching this movie, and, and I related to it, and I, and I found that it relates to so many people that I talk to, the fact that most of us seem to go through this phase in life where we struggle to figure out who we are. And for many of us, it is during our 20s, like this guy, Saru. I mean, he, he, he already went through school. He went through college. 
And then he got to the point where he's like, I can't move forward until I understand a little bit more about who I am. And his experience is a little more extreme than most of us. But the truth is, many of us go through that same experience. And in fact, the Bible kind of understands that, which is why the Bible actually talks about our relationship with God in terms of adoption. Because it talks about it that way because it understands that for us to understand who we really are, we have to understand our relationship with God. Most people believe that God created the world. A lot of people would say they believe that God created us. But many people don't understand really who God is and how we're supposed to relate to God. And because we don't understand that, we struggle to move forward in a very similar way to Saru in this movie. Now, sometimes we keep moving, and so we keep working at a job, and we, we keep trying to figure out relationships, and we struggle, and we, we try one path, and it doesn't work out, and we try another. And, and what if we could understand a little bit more about who we are right now and be able to move forward? Because I've also seen people who don't figure it out, who don't understand that, and they get to be you know, in their 40s and 50s, and they've been working down a path. I have a bunch of friends who have been very successful in their careers. They work to a path, and all of a sudden, they get to their mid-40s, and they're kind of like, Wait, why did I do that? Why did I do all this stuff that I've been doing? Is that really who I am? And so what I want to do tonight is I want to look at a few passages from the Bible that talk about this idea of being adopted by God. I mean, that's just a... Just, just take a second and think about that for a minute. Like The Bible talks about this idea of being adopted by the God who created the universe. That's the imagery it uses for us to understand a little bit more about who we are. So just follow along with me as I read the first passage we're going to read on this. It's from the Ephesians chapter 1. It starts in verse 3. It's written by a guy named Paul. In fact, all the passages we're going to read tonight were written by Paul. He was really powerfully wanted to communicate to us this idea of adoption. Follow along as I read here. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavishes on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mysteries of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purported in Christ, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the time reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So as I said, this passage uses this just amazingly powerful understanding, this word adoption, to describe how we're supposed to understand God, how we're supposed to understand ourselves as humans, and how we're supposed to understand how God and humanity relates. And my hope for tonight is that you walk away from this room and walk out into the world and go, holy cow, this is who God is, this is who I am, and this is how I get to relate to him? So we want to answer the question tonight, well, what does it mean to be adopted by God? What does that mean? One of the things it means is it means that God chose you. God chose chose you. Now, there's a major difference between being adopted and not being adopted. Before I had kids, my wife and I had friends, and they had three kids, and I guess because we didn't have any kids, they decided we should watch their kids. I'm just kidding. My wife loved kids, so she probably wanted to do it, and I love my wife. <laughs> so before we had kids, my friends, they had three kids. They were going away for like four nights, just in case you're understanding, if someone asks you to watch their kids for four nights, that means five days. Four nights, five days. Again, maybe I didn't do this thinking through before I went. So we said, yes, we'll watch your kids for four nights and five days. So we go over to their house, and 
It was a traumatic experience. First of all, my wife was sick. She was throwing up. Then one of the kids got sick, throwing up. And when kids get sick and throw up, they don't understand that you're supposed to run to like the bathroom and go in the toilet. They just throw up all over themselves in the bed, just like, just all over. And then, and then a couple hours later, they do it again, just all over themselves. And my wife is sick and throwing up. So who gets to clean up both the kids and the wife and all the, oh, me. After four days or five days and four nights, my wife and I went home and we said, we are not ready to have kids. And then we found out the reason my wife was sick <laughs> was because she was pregnant. That was the start of our first kid. We now have five kids, just so you know. And we didn't choose to have that first kid. I mean, we knew that it might happen. Ask your parents how that works if you want to know. We knew that it might happen, but we didn't choose. In fact, it was kind of a traumatic thing when we found out my wife was pregnant because I was in graduate school at the time and she was working to pay the bills. And literally, we're like, I, I don't know how this is going to work out. You're, you're paying the bills. I'm going to school. You're supposed to pay the bills. I'm supposed to go to school. I don't know how it's going to work out. What are we doing pregnant now? If you're adopted, it's because your parents chose you don't accidentally adopt someone, right? What happened? Where did this baby come from? You can accidentally get pregnant. Ask your health teacher. If you're adopted, it's because the parents said, you know what? I really want to invest in this child's life. I really want them. It's not an accident. It's not something that just could have just happened. It is because I specifically, not only that, it usually takes a lot of effort, a lot of money, and you actually, then you get this baby because you chose. And so when this passage says that God adopted us, it means that God chose us. In fact, this passage goes beyond that. It goes to say that God actually chose us before the creation of the world. It kind of blows your mind if you think about it. And if you want to talk about like predestination and that kind of stuff, talk to these seminary students over there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm looking at you, Myers. <laughs> Sam Myers is about to, about to start seminary. Raise your hand, Sam. Go talk to Sam. He'd love to talk to you about uh, predestination, all those kind of things. We're not going to talk about that tonight because it really doesn't matter for our passage. Whether God chose you based on his foreknowledge or because of some other reason he had, it doesn't matter. Talk to Sam. Here's what does matter. What does matter is that God chose you. It wasn't an accident. It's not an accident that you're here in this church tonight. It's not an accident that you had the opportunity to understand who God is and that you've made a decision to follow him and are growing. Before the creation of the world, God saw your life. He understood it. God is outside of time. And he said, you know that person? They're really special. You know that person? I, you know what? I, I need them to be a part of what I'm doing in this world. And so I'm going to make sure that they understand who I am and how to live that out. Now, there's some of us that even when you say, hey, God chose you, you kind of think back to like elementary school when you were picking like kickball teams and you were the last one picked. And you're kind of like, okay, I understand God chose me, but it was because there was no one else, right? Like, I was the last one. They picked all the other kids, and they're like, all right, uh, I'll take him on my team. Like, that's, that's still in our mind. That's how we think of God choosing us often. We think like, okay, yeah, maybe God chose me, but like, he must have like got to the end of the line, and there was no one else left. That's not true. That's not why God chose us at all. In fact, in fact, it talks about how God chose us. Let me get the exact quote here. God chose us in accordance with his pleasure and will. It was not just by accident. It's not just because everyone else was picked. It was because God said, you know what? There's something about that person, some way who they are. I created them in a very specific way so that I could use them. If you ever wake up, any morning, and you feel like you're sort of useless, that's a lie. 
That is an absolute lie. God created you. He chose you. And every morning you can wake up and say, okay, God, what are we going to do today? And whether you feel that way a lot, a lot of times the way we think about God is based on our own feelings. So if I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling like, you know, oh, this is just another boring morning. I got to go to my annoying job. If you wake up and you feel down, you feel like God doesn't care about you as much. That's not the way it works. God chose you. God adopted you, no matter whether you feel that way or not. In this movie, there's actually two sons that were adopted. Saru that we saw, and he's got another son, a brother that was adopted as well. And the movie doesn't really show him a lot. In fact, I went and read about him because you kind of wonder about this other brother because he had some problems. He seemed to have some mental issues in the movie. They allude to the fact that he kind of was on drugs and some of these kind of things. And so I actually did some research on him and looked up some of the interviews on him. And, And it's actually true that he had some major issues in his life, partly because of his adoption, partly because of the things that happened to him before he got adopted. And sometimes when we think about this, we think, well, well, God maybe doesn't love me as much because of the things I've done. When you go, and I, and I saw some interviews with the real mom who Nicole Kidman plays in the movie, and she talks a little bit. They don't talk a lot because he still has some issues. But she talks a little bit about how, no, no, I, I love him. Even though he's kind of had some struggles in his life, I love him. In fact, in this movie, when Saru goes on this four-year period where he's just obsessed, the mom had some struggles with it, but, but she still loves him. The dad still loves him all through that. God loves us and chose us, and there's nothing we can do to change that. We can run away from God, and he's disappointed like a parent would be but he still loves us and still chose us. Being adopted by God means that God chose you. Being adopted by God also means that God lavishes grace on you. Did you hear that part of this verse? In verse 7 it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Now, now, what does grace mean? Right? He lavished grace on us. Well, grace means a couple things. Grace means, one, that you are given something you don't deserve. If someone comes up to you and says, here, have my car. You don't deserve it, but I'm just going to give it to you. You'd probably be excited. Maybe you wouldn't. Maybe you have a nicer car than I do. But if someone gives you something you don't deserve, that's grace. The other aspect of grace is when someone doesn't punish you, even though you deserve punishment. If you break the car, if you break someone else's car, you borrow it and you get in a car wreck and the person says, you know what, I'm going to graciously not ask you to pay to repair my car. And this understanding in this verse includes both of those things. The fact that God does not punish us even though we deserve it. That's what grace means in the Bible. That if you put your faith in Jesus and say, I want to follow him, God graciously forgives us of everything we've ever done, ever. There's no th- nothing he doesn't forgive us of, which is also a concept we have a hard time understanding. Because the truth is, in every other relationship in our life, when someone forgives us, they still hold on to it a little bit. There's a phrase that people like to use. It says, forgive and forget. That never works except with God. It doesn't work. Think about the people you've actually forgiven, right? You have an annoying friend who always asks you for help, and, uh, and, and, and you're kind of like, oh, they're asking me again, but the last time I helped them, it turned out to be a mess, and then like in the back of your head, it's always there. When someone's done something to you, it's always there. The only person that can forgive and forget is God. So when you think about God, he knows everything you've ever done, He's no every, he knows everything, every thought you've ever had in your life. And God says, no, you know what? I will forgive you. Lavishes grace on us. He doesn't just forgive us. He says, not only am I going to forgive you, I'm actually going to give you some help in your life. I am going to give you what you don't deserve. 
Sometimes, again, when we think about God and we think about him adopting us, we think, okay, yeah, okay, God, I, I know that you're going to help me, but uh, I know that you forgive me, but maybe you're just kind of going to leave me. That's not the way God works. In fact, another way that God adopts us is that he molds us into being who we cre- were created to be. God molds us into being who we were created to be. God just doesn't leave us. Imagine in the movie... If the people adopted Saru, a five-year-old little boy, and they took him to Australia, so they took him into his, out of this orphanage that was a really tough place, and they take him to Australia, and they're like, okay, Saru, you're on your own. We got you out of the orphanage. Now just go have your way in Australia. That wouldn't be much help. Sometimes we feel that way about God. We think, God, okay, I know God forgives me, but why isn't he with me right now? Why isn't he helping me right now? The truth is, God is helping you right now. You may not see it. You may not understand it, but he is. That's what an adopted parent does. They help you out. They try to give you the strength that you need, the understanding that you need. There's another verse up there. It's from Romans where, again, Paul talks about being adopted. He says, we know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so... But we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Now, this talks about adoption in a slightly different way. It actually says, hey, we're eagerly awaiting for adoption. Why does it say that? We've just been saying we were adopted. Why does it say we eagerly await adoption? Well, here's what that means. It starts off by talking about the groans of childbirth. Now, I've never given birth to a child, but I have been there four different times when children were given birth to, and I've seen it. And during one of those times when my wife gave birth, the doctor actually asked me, are you okay? Like, she just had a baby, okay? She said, and they looked at me, and the reason was because I was like white, like the the, the blood had drained from me because I was like, holy moly, what just happened here? I've never given birth, but I hear it's painful. And so what this says, it says from the creation that, that, that uh, has been groaning of the pains of childhood, what this means is, hey, when we look around in the world, we see that it's messed up. We do. Every one of us does. When you look around the world, you're like, oh, yeah, I, that shouldn't be that way. People shouldn't treat each other that way. There shouldn't be kids who are in this kind of an orphanage. Like, it, this is not right. We see that the world's not right. And ultimately, that's because that there's sin that came into the world. And so the world is broken, and it's groaning. I mean, you see that, even in your friends. Think of your friends at school or at work, who just, you look at them, and you're like, man, I, man you're groaning because uh, you don't understand what life's about. I wish you could understand a little bit who God is. And what this is saying is, hey, this earth is groaning because it's broken, because it's sinful. But then it says that we eagerly await our adoption to sonship and the redemption of our bodies. Here's what this means. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are adopted. But you don't have the fullness of that adoption because that fullness of the adoption means there's no more sin in your life. You are absolutely perfect and things are perfect. And that only happens in heaven. So ultimately, when this says we are eagerly awaiting our adoption, it means we are awaiting the fulfillment of our adoption, which is perfection with God in heaven. And so it says even now we're groaning a little bit, which most of us understand. When we look at our lives now, even if we've accepted Jesus and we understand that God's forgiven us, we still struggle. We still groan a little bit. And that's what this is saying, that we get to experience the benefits of adoption right now, but the fullness with God in heaven. And that in itself is something that should amaze us, astound us. The fact that we understand that someday we are going to be with God in a place where there's no pain, no suffering, no mean people ever. Just imagine that. That's what we have to look forward to. That's what adoption means. Adoption means that someday I get to spend eternity with God in a place where there's absolutely no pain, no sin, no suffering. When we understand that, It blows us away. It changes the way we see our life, too. When we begin to understand, wow, this is what I got adopted into. 
I was actually adopted into this family that leads to eternity with God in heaven. But it also means, okay, I, I understand that I need to try to follow who God is now, right? Part of molding us is understanding, oh, well, you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to do everything I can to follow who God is now. If you get adopted into a family, it often changes things. I mentioned my wife had a friend who uh, runs an adoption agency. Well, her other best friend from high school, they also adopted kids. Now, she did get married. They had kids. They ultimately had six kids, adopted six more. And part of the reason they adopted six more is they adopted some kids, and then they adopted uh, some of their siblings. They realized some of their siblings weren't adopted, so they said, we're going to take them in. They have 12 kids. It's crazy. Not only that, just, just a little aside here, they live in like these row houses in town. The, this, these, her two best friends, they, they fenced in their yards together, and they're just like little, little uh, yards in town, and they have 18 kids that live there. So you should go visit them sometime. Anyway... When they adopted these other kids that had already kind of been a little older and been other things, there were some struggles. They had never really been in a family that like showed kind of love, but also had rules and how you're supposed to act and how you're supposed to interact with each other. And in many ways, God does the same thing for us. He says, you're adopted into my family, but, but there are ways that are helpful to live. Sometimes we get adopted. We understand we're adopted by God, but we don't quite understand the responsibility of that because it does come with responsibility. The responsibility is, hey, God, you adopted me. You're actually going to help me live now. I get to spend eternity with you. You know what? I want to live for you. In fact, that's our motivation. Sometimes when we think about following God, you think about, oh, yeah, God just wants us to follow these rules. No. God says, I want to adopt you into my kingdom, and there's ways that it's better for you to live. And so I'm going to ask you to do that. And some of those ways are actually sacrificing yourself for other people, like serving other people considering other people better than yourself, forgiving other people, giving of your time and money so that other people can have it even when you could spend it on yourself. Like, these are better ways to live. I wish you could do that. And when we understand who God is and what he's done for us, we, we say, yeah, you know what? I want to live that way. Why? Because I know how much I'm adopted, how much that means. There's one more thing that it means to be adopted. It means that God, who's our father and our dad, is proud of us. The last verse I want to read that Paul wrote on adoption is Galatians 4.4. 4. It says this, But when the, time, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's children. And since you are his children, God has made you also an heir. Now this verse talks about how God actually puts his spirit inside us. When we put our faith in Jesus, he puts his spirit inside us and we become heirs, heirs to the kingdom of God, heirs to the kingdom of the creator of the universe. We are heirs. We have part of that inheritance. Again, I, I think one of the reasons this concept, this idea of being adopted by God is so important is that it clears up kind of this misconception of how we understand God. To, to be honest, one of the toughest things for me is not believing that I'm forgiven. For whatever reason, I'm like, I understand, okay, God forgives me. However, even though I believe that God forgives me, I feel like most of the time God's disappointed in me. Uh, just think about that in your head. When you think of God, and when you think of what God thinks of when he looks at you, do you think God is looking at you and is disappointed? Because most of the time, God is proud of you. There are times when he's disappointed. But if I think about my own kids, like there are times when I'm disappointed, my kids don't do what I ask them to do, and I'm like, ah. But the most of the time, I'm so proud of them. Even when they try hard and they don't quite get it the way you would like, you're still like, man, good try. If your conception of God is that he's angry at you and disappointed at you, you don't really fully understand who God is. There's a scene in the movie 
where Saru has been now on his like four years, he's been struggling to find his home. His brother that I talked about earlier has gone off and didn't think she shouldn't do. The mom kind of had almost like a breakdown. And Saru comes and talks to his mom and he actually apologizes a little bit for who they are. And her answer to him is so powerful. And I think it kind of expresses a little bit the heart of God towards us. Let's check out this clip. Do you see what Saru did? He said, I'm sorry you couldn't have kids. His assumption was, hey, 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 mom, I, I'm sorry we messed up. Like, I know you tried. You want to be kind of, we just couldn't live up to what you wanted us to be. And, and I am so disappointed. I know you're disappointed in who I am. She looks at him and she says, we chose you. Tonight, if you're sitting here, and you feel like God's disappointed or mad at you, I want you to know that God says, no, I chose you. I chose you because I love you. I would adopt you. You became my son and my daughter, and I want to give you my entire kingdom. I want the best for your life. I want you to succeed. I want you to understand love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and all the things that are the fruits of of the Spirit of God, this is what I want for you. The band's going to come back up, and we're going to sing a little bit more. And as we do that, I want you to think about how do you see yourself before God? Do you see yourself as someone who has been forgiven by God, been adopted by God, is part of of God's family because he loves you so much, because he wants so much for you to succeed. I was thinking about a really bizarre example of this. I'm a big sports fan. Those of you who know me know I'm a big basketball fan. And so I watch things like the NBA draft. And in the NBA draft, there was one player that got more attention than probably anyone else. Who was that? Those of you who know that. Lonzo Ball. For those of you who aren't into sports, you don't know who this guy is. Lonzo Ball is a player, and he was drafted number two, which means he's like the second best player that's not playing professional basketball in the world right now, which is pretty amazing. But the reason he got so much attention is because of his dad. His dad is like this, he's got this, like, he talks crazy. He, he talks about how his son is better than anyone else in the world. He just talks like crazy. And, and, but I, I, it was interesting. I heard a couple of former professional athletes talk about this Lonzo Ball, his dad. And they said, you know who what he sounds like a little bit? They said, he, he kind of sounds like my dad. Because my dad used to tell me, man, you can do it. You're going you're gonna to be the best basketball player. You're going to be the best football player out there. And they said, even though he's a little crazy and a little arrogant and all that, he, he's, there, he's encouraging his son. He's spurring him on. He's like, hey, you can do it. And that's what God is saying to us tonight. He's saying, hey, I know it's a little bit of a struggle and you're still kind of groaning a little bit. But hey, I want the best for you. I want you to understand how much you're loved that I chose you. That I'm going to mold you into who I wanted you to be. And I'll be there with you, cheering you on the entire way. Let's pray. God, we do thank you so much for how much you love us. I mean, it's beyond what we can imagine. I mean, to be adopted by the creator of the universe, it's just unbelievable to think about what that means. The fact that you forgive us, lavish your grace on us. You, just, you don't just give, you lavish it on us. God, I pray that you would help us tonight to understand more deeply that in our deep parts of our soul, we'd feel this peace because we understand that we are adopted by you, that you're with us, you're for us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.